awesome. You guys let us know that you are hopping on. Sorry, we had a little bit of technical issues. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, we are glad that you are here to join us today. Um, you can put something in the chat box. Just let us know that you're there and that you can hear us. Larry from Fort Bend Master Gardeners. Thank you guys. Um, it is really windy out here today, so <laughs> we're trying to work the best that we can with that. Um, we want to welcome you guys here. Um, we are, are here at Texas A&M with the Leech Teaching Gardens, and we're talking vegetable gardening today. Um, it's that time. A lot of us have gotten um, the itch to get out in the garden and we're so excited to share and answer some of your gardening questions here today. Um, today here with us we've got Skip Richter. Um, I'm sorry about the wind noise y'all it's just windy we're doing the best <laughs> we're doing the very best that we can it's, it's part of what we've got with live so Skip you may want to try to get as close as possible to okay. this mic. Are we getting some wind noise? Um, it says we are okay. um, so so anyway, we'll just we'll try the best that we can, you guys, and thank y'all for being patient with us. Um, we wanted to introduce Skip Richter. Skip is our county horticulturist here in Brazos County, um, and we wanted this to be uh, really informative and a time for you guys to ask questions. So if y'all have questions um, that come up, we're going to try to monitor those in the chat uh, to be able to answer your questions, and then Skip's going to go over just some kind of basic things for you to think about as you're getting ready for your spring vegetable gardening. So. Skip, it's all you. All right. Well, we do apologize for the wind. I can't control the wind, but I can try to minimize the hot air, if you know what I mean. All right. So what we're going to do is talk about things that you might be doing right now in the vegetable garden. First of all, we're here at the gardens at A&M, and if you, if you live in the area or you're ever visiting College Station, you really need to come out and see this place. It's a, it's kind of give a pan across the gardens. There's a lot of the winter... Uh, hill here but a lot of it has already been clipped out and new plants are going in and I would say in another few weeks there's going to be a whole lot blooming here and the garden has pretty much everything you would want to grow in your vegetable garden during the particular season when you're visiting. So we've got uh, some eggplant here that we just planted the other day. They're just kind of getting started. A number of different kinds of peppers. Uh, we have bell peppers. We've got a long uh, cornito uh, the gallo, it's a, it's kind of a, a um, horn, uh, Italian horn frying pepper, very unusual kind of thing. You ought to try it sometime. Uh, we've also got some jalapenos. There's the hot jalapenos, which is regular jalapenos. Those are about uh, what eight, nine thousand heat units. And then we have some very mild jalapenos we're trying. One called Trick You, one called Fooled You, uh, one called uh, Felicity. Those are all. Uh, wimpy jalapenos, but I like those because I can use those as the main part of the dish and then add a few hot jalapenos to get the heat up to whatever level uh, my particular guests are able to tolerate. So we've got tomatoes and chard, a beautiful, I don't know if you can see it from there, but a beautiful Vulcan red chard. Back there back oh, isn't that there gorgeous? types of tomatoes to grow. Uh, there's the slicer types for your sandwich, uh, the grape types, and the cherry types. The grapes being more oblong and the cherry more round. Uh, we've got some pretty cool types. I've got one called Midnight Snack and that's one of the, the new cherry types that, you know, people used to love red tomatoes. Now they want everything that's weird. So we've got tomatoes that look like they've been tie-dyed and things like that. Uh, Midnight Snack has kind of reddish shoulders and a mottled coloring through the fruit. Uh, it's a tomato and it's good. We enjoy growing it. There's a lot of good different varieties. 
varieties that you can see here. Tomatoes like warm weather and we have to get them in and get them producing fast. So we plant as early as we can. We choose varieties that are as large as we can, uh, or that, the plants that is, that are as large as we can so that they can start fruiting right away before summer heat arrives. Once it gets hot, and hot means temperatures in the 90s in the daytime, and when it's probably 72 to 75 at night, they're gonna start having trouble setting. And so we need varieties that set well in the heat. The cherries and grapes do better than the sun. Sorry, it's like 25 mile an hour wind. Gale force wind. <laughs> we are, Man, we are trying. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, okay. this is the joy of live. Um, yeah, live. But it's more entertaining for the viewer to watch things fall right, apart. Oh, is Y'all don't want to see me. <laughs> there okay. we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, I will say one thing about tomatoes uh, regarding caging and staking. Sometimes people like to stake their tomatoes, and that means you're putting a, a tall, strong stake beside them. You're pinching off all the suckers, which are the little shoots that occur wherever a leaf attaches to the vine, and you're uh, then training them up the stake. You get a little bit larger fruit, maybe a little bit earlier fruit that way, uh, but most people go with cages, and there's all kinds of cages out there. Cages remove the first two suckers, two or three suckers, So down here, a leaf attached to the stem, that's the one in my hand, and this plant right here, this is the sucker, you can see it came out of the leaf, and it's growing its own shoot. So uh, that's... Skip, here's a question. A lot of them are asking about the plants for tonight, and do they need to do anything to cover them? Because we're supposed to get some cold tonight, they said maybe in the upper 30s, low 40s. Our, our tomatoes will not like it. Our peppers and eggplant will definitely not like it. But they'll survive it. Uh, that's not low enough for us. We have other plants. If you can just help them from being set back a little bit, and they'll do a little bit better that way. Uh, if you can't cover them, don't worry about it. The one thing I'm covering in my garden is basil. Basil hates the 40s. And so uh, I'm covering my basil tonight. They're not going to like the temperatures we're having. Uh, but the rest of the plants probably will be okay uh, just for a night or two. And it's warming up during the day. So I think it'll be fine. Okay. So, let's talk about squash just a little bit while we're waiting for some other questions. Uh, we've got a couple of different kinds of squash here. Uh, there's a zucchini type uh, called Senator. And then this the yellow type is one of the really precocious yellow uh, squashes. This particular one is called uh, multi-pick, and you can see it is setting a lot. Look at all the little female blooms. Those are these here with the little tiny squash at the base of the bloom. All of the squashes and cucurbits have separate male and female flowers. So this is obviously a female flower with a squash on it. And there's three or four more female flowers. This is a male flower. Instead of a squash on the bottom, it's just got this stalk. Yeah, so that same principle would hold true for watermelons. It would have a little round baby green watermelon if it's a female. It would hold true for cucumbers. It'll have a little tiny, um, you know, pipe cleaner size uh, fuzzy cucumber on the bottom if it's a female. Uh, cantaloupe would be another one or muskmelon would be another one like that. So the nice thing about the precocious types of yellow squash like pick and pick and super pick is another variety is they set a lot of fruit. A lot of types of squash will start off producing male blooms and people will say well it's blooming but it's not fruiting and that's because it hadn't started producing female blooms yet. So being able to see and tell the difference like we're showing you here that will really help you out. So you guys on the top is the female bloom and the bottom is the male bloom. Yeah so on this particular plant I see one, two, three, four female blooms and there's one male bloom here. There's a couple of male blooms down here that are coming on. You can see there's 
there's three male blooms right together. There's no squash at the bottom of them, but you need both and you need bees to do the trick of moving pollen from one to the other. Uh, or you can do it yourself if for some reason you don't have bees. Bees don't like wet weather. They don't like real windy weather. When I say bees, I mean our honeybees. They tend to kind of hang out in the hive when the conditions aren't great. And Skip, that's the here's time. A, here's a squash question. Um, a lot of them are asking, um, they tend to get squash vine borers. What, yes. what do we do about that so I'm, it doesn't I'm glad destroy? you asked. <laughs> Believe it or not, that wasn't a planted question. There's not a good answer for squash vine borers. If you spray to kill the pests, you probably are going to kill bees that are doing the work for you of pollinating. You can use a lightweight row cover fabric, but my newest favorite product is this netting. And it comes, there's a lot of brands, but you can see my hand through the netting. Uh, it's just a little tiny, very soft screen, it's like screen wire on your windows. Uh, there's different versions of it, but look how much light comes through it. Water goes through it, but bugs can't get through it. So anything that would want to come in and get on your plants, uh, the netting will help. And you just put it very loosely over the plant and the plants just grow up underneath it. The only thing to keep in mind is when your squash is setting female blooms, uh, when you start to see those, you've got to get up and do all the hand pollinating yourself. And, and so, y'all, I, I apologize about the wind and I, I've seen several of the comments. We actually have a high powered wind cover over this, one of those dead cat covers. It is just extremely windy yeah. out here today. And, and I apologize. I mean, we're doing the, <laughs> we're doing the best we can, but um, we do already have a wind cover over the mic. Hopefully, if I need to repeat something, I can, or hopefully they can still understand me despite the wind noise. So anyway, squash has to have pollination. So if you use a cover like this, that will keep the borer out, but you've got to do a little pollinating. So if you've got an acre of squash, So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Another good use of this would be like uh, eggplant. Get flea beetles on them that make holes in the leaves. And you could put this over your eggplant. Once they get up to about the fifth or sixth leaf stage, in other words, five to six true leaves, you can pull it off. And at that point, the beetles are just not going to set your eggplant back much. And you can not worry about them anymore. So it's a good, it's a good product. Uh, you can buy, buy it online. Uh, I suppose some garden centers would have it as well, uh, but those are reusable, and uh, I think it's a good way to deal with that problem with the squat. You know, if, if people wanted to have like a couple of organic options of control to handle some of the pests that they might see, whether it's worm or tomato worm, or what, what are some things like that that you can do for those that might be interested in more organic tools that you recommend? start with is, is insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap works against small soft-bodied insects like spider mites and aphids. That would be a good uh, a good use of it. It'll even help against very young caterpillars, but not once they molt once or twice, then it's not going to be very effective. Uh, so the next thing would be horticultural oil. Those are very lightweight oils. They're not they're not as heavy a viscous as dormant oil or have the impurities that dormant oil sometimes has in it, uh, but they're very lightweight. And horticultural oils would work on all the small soft bodies I mentioned, plus then you can add scale in. Uh, oils are very effective against scale, so it takes it one step past soap to do that. So like a neem oil? Like a, well, a neem oil would be an, an oil, yes. Okay. Uh, but normally it just says horticultural oil or summer oil on okay. the label. Uh, and the next two products, I'll put them together, are neem, oh, <laughs> here we go, let me hold this, there we go, <laughs> neem and spinosad, uh, neem is from a tropical tree kin to china berries, some of you may remember china berries, if, if you were ever a teenage boy, you know it's the best slingshot ammo in the neighborhood, uh, but anyway, uh, china berry, or neem rather, uh, is a very effective product against leaf feeding pests and certain other pests. 
So if, it, if it's a stink bug that sucks out of your plants, not so much for, for the name, it's okay, but not as effective. But if it's a leaf feeding beetle or caterpillar, name is pretty good. The other product is spinosad. That comes from a soil actinomycete. And uh, it's another organic product. And it also works against leaf feeding pests. The nice thing about both neem and spinosad is, and this is unusual for any product, especially in organic, is it soaks into the leaf. So if you spray this side of a leaf and a bug feeds over here, it's still going to get that product. And uh, it's, it's not systemic in that it moves all through the plant, but when you spray it, it soaks in and it lasts a little while. A lot of our organics uh, just break down. The only other one I would recommend at this point, uh, you know, early in the going, would be BT, which is a soil microbe, a Bacillus thuringiensis, and it controls caterpillars. It's very specific for caterpillars. Uh, there is one form of BT called San Diego, like the city in California, that isn't a caterpillar control, it's a beetle control for leaf feeding beetles. Uh, so if you have Colorado potato beetle uh, on your plant eating or something like that, the San Diego type of BT uh, might be an organic option for that. Now there are a lot of other products, there's pyrethrins and others, uh, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stay away from those. I like to recommend whenever possible arrows that fly in and hit the pest and not the good guys, then BT is an example of an arrow. Uh, grenades kill everything you spray them on, good and bad. And when we do that, if you're an organic gardener, you're trying to maintain a balance of nature and it tends to throw, throw things uh, out of whack. So I'm going to not go into those uh, at this particular time on that question. Skip, if they're doing uh, and brown as, just the time to We're still running from the wind, guys. <laughs> um, if they're doing in ground beds and they wanted to incorporate some type of compost or organic matter, um, what would you recommend to kind of help improve the soil structure and maybe some of the fertility using compost or organic matter? Well, well made compost. That means it's been screened so that there's not big chunks of wood. Uh, and it means that it's been pretty much fully composted so that it's not still in more of a, a raw stage where it has a lot of composting left to do would be good. If you've never improved soil before, I might put two or three inches down and mix it in as deep as you can. If you have been taking care of your garden with a little improvements, an inch is more than enough at any one time to mix into the soil and benefit it in that way. Compost helps the sand hold moisture and nutrients. Compost helps a clay form structure and drain better. And compost in and of itself is plant materials. So it releases those nutrients. Think so there were a couple people that they really wanted that list <laughs> that you talked about of, of some of those um, things like the oils and stuff to control okay. some of the pests. Is that something you could maybe provide later or post for let's, them? Let's get our, our Aggie Hort uh, question and answer team. If you would type in uh, insecticidal soap, horticultural oil, BT, spinosad, and neem. I think those are the ones uh -huh. I mentioned. Uh, then people can go hunt those down. But, uh, let me say one thing about neem while we're talking. I don't want to do pesticides only today, but Neem comes in two forms. One is neem oil, and everything we said about oil, horticultural oil, applies to neem oil. The other form is the ingredient, not clarified oil of neem, but it'll say azadirectin, long word, A-Z-A, azadirectin, and that is an ingredient taken out of the natural neem product that is insecticidal, and it causes insects to stop feeding, it causes them to stop developing through their uh, life stages of molting, developing like insects do. And so those are two very different products. They both come from the neem tree. One is the just the pressed oil, the other is the extracted insecticidal ingredient azadirachtin. Okay, lots of our lots of our vegetables are heavy feeders. Okay, so what are some recommendations, general recommendations you have on just when to fertilize, how much to fertilize okay. um, for a lot of your vegetables? Uh, let's let's take a chance in the wind again uh, and go over here to this bed. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about some of the fertilizer. I got some examples. Okay, perfect. Use. Y'all just say a prayer that the wind is going to be our friend. <laughs> We're out in the open. I'm going to show you guys a few different kinds of fertilizer. I'm trying to stay away from brand names because 
we don't want to, we don't want to promote one brand, a particular company. Uh, but this is just an example of a synthetic fertilizer. You can see a lot of different colors of prills in it. Not all synthetics have multiple colors like that. But just, that's just an example. That's an immediate release. You dissolve it, it gets wet, and it releases the nutrients. This is an example of an organic fertilizer. This one looks like rabbit food. Not all of them do. But I want to talk about the difference. Uh, these release their nutrients right away, and it's easy to make a product that has the particular blend you want, because it's being made by blending the chemistries together to make the fertilizer. So if you want a 3-1-2 ratio, or if you want a, just nitrogen, 1-0-0 zero, zero ratio, uh, you can do that. With the organic products, you tend to get more of a blend already. But it's usually a good blend for plants because it's typically made from plant materials. The organics have to break down through microbial decomposition. So microbes are taking the nutrients in this and they're essentially turning, it, turning them loose into the soil where plants can take them up. And uh, that's, the, that's the advantage of an organic, but it's also, it, it delays the release a little bit. And in cold soil, in your winter gardens, organics can be a little slow to release because microbial activity slows down. Within the synthetics, you can also get slow release products that maybe be, are prills that are coated and they release their nutrients slowly over time. Uh, and depending on how they coat them, they can make them very slow release or moderately slow release. And then the final thing would be products that you mix in water to wash into the soil when you put a new transplant in, the very soluble. Typically those make, you know, your fertilizer water looks blue or greenish colored uh, and you wash them right in. And the organic equivalent of that would be uh, fish emulsion and seaweed mixes. Uh, you're not gonna have the same concentrations or the same control over nutrient uh, uh, ratios, but that would be the, the organic gardener option uh, for that kind of fertilizer. S Skip, Sandy asked a question. Did I miss the part about the stink bugs or assassin bugs that destroy my tomatoes? <laughs> I, I try to an not answer hard questions, Sandy. <laughs> That's too hard. All right, let's, let's talk about uh, that question. Stink bugs and their cousin, the leaf-footed bug. Uh, those uh, are not part in your tomato. And fun fact, the reason you have little, little hard yellow spots or white spots on your tomato is because, uh, is it lunchtime? Oh, this will be great. They spit in your tomato and their caustic spit dissolves the cells and then they slurp up the dissolved spit and tomato products and that's what they feed on. And then they move over and do that again. So every little yard, a little yellow spot that's hard, that's bug spit cause that. And uh, you can tell your guests when you're serving them your fresh garden tomatoes what those yellow spots are and they'll appreciate that. Do we need to move on? Um, well, I'll try to get down here if you're going to show planting. I'll just see does if that, I can... Does that help with the wind? Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you, you mentioned, Sandy, also assassin bug. And assassin bugs are... Um, they're a beneficial insect. They're like the Tyrannosaurus rex of the garden. They run around chasing stuff down and eating it. And uh, so they're good guys. And you can go online and learn the difference so you don't kill the good guys. When we plant plants, whether it's little regular transplants like this eggplant or something like this giant tomato that I've been growing since January in the house, uh, you want to make sure and water them in well with a fertilizer and plant them properly. Tomatoes form along the stem. So take a look at this stem. Lisa, can you get in here real close to where my finger is on that? See the roots forming? I'm going to move the plant so you don't have to move the camera. Uh, but look at the bumps right here. And even coming down here, there's little bumps on the edge of the stem. Those are root initials waiting to grow. So if we can back out a little bit, when you plant a uh, tomato, just like this and then water it in really well here now typically what I'll do is, is build a little bit of a berm like this around them so when I water all the water goes right down in this spot rather than just rolling off and it also reminds me that my original root system is here but within a couple of weeks you're gonna have roots forming all along this stem that we bury in the ground. That, Skip, a few questions on just transplants 
plants. You know, there's so many choices when you go to the garden center. Um, and there are some that are better for the area. Yeah. So how can they find which ones are best for their area? There are certain things they should look for as far as disease or insect resistance on the label that that's, might be helpful. That's a good that's a good point. Tomatoes are looking for the most letters you can get after the tomato variety name. So V, F, N are three common letters. You may also see T. V and F are two soil-borne diseases that it, that plant is resistant to if it has a B or an F after the name. N is a letter that's hard to come by. Our new uh, Aggie, um, what, what do we got? Superstar uh, celebrity is nematode resistant. It has an N after the name. And you may see T, which is tobacco mosaic virus. There's a lot of other letters that can be on there. Uh, but the more letters you get, I guess the one way to look at it is the more resistant that plant uh, is going to be. As far as the recommended varieties, talk to your county extension office, go online to Aggie Horticulture. There's a publication on every vegetable you'd want to grow and it'll recommend a few varieties on that. And also talk to local gardeners. You know, varieties, every year we get a dozen or more of each plant variety that comes out and we just can't keep up on our publications with every new variety. And so local gardeners will be another good source uh, as to what, which ones you might want to recommend. Do we have uh, some more questions? Or um, well, I'm, I'm trying to find our chat. Well, <laughs> while Lisa's getting the question, I just want to talk a little bit about planting seed. Uh, when we plant seed, the goal is to put a seed in about four times as deep as the seed is wide. And I've got a few seeds here. Uh, these happen not to be vegetable seed, but it's a variety that doesn't like to germinate very well or plant. What I've done is pre-sprout these. I soak the seed in warm water and I put them, I have a little warm uh, spot on top of my coffee maker where I can put a little container full of seeds and look how they're already starting to sprout. So once the seed is ready to sprout like that, you can just, you know that thing's gonna grow. You can just drop these in the ground at the appropriate spacing like so and cover them up and there you're well on your way. You don't need to pre-sprout every seed you plant things that are a little slower to come along, like okra seed would be a good example. We're about to start planting okra as it warms up. Uh, those pre-sprouting will give you a head start on. You'll get, uh, you'll get things going a little bit faster. So I just wanted to show you that technique. Uh, but in general, about four times as wide as the seed. So let's look at this seed here. This little seed, I say that's about a half inch wide. So I'm going to probably plant that one about an inch and a half to two inches deep in the soil. So imagine something really tiny like a sesame seed sized seed uh, that's going to be planted much more shallow. After you plant them, you want to water them in well. It's always a good idea to give them a good soaking. There was a question about do you need to add microbials or is there enough in the soil and does this technique also work for herb seeds? The, the technique also works for herb seeds. water up and just roll them in the inoculant and it sticks to the seed and then you plant it and it gives those rhizobia bacteria that help that bean or pea form nodules uh, which fix nitrogen and, and feed the plant uh, it helps them get off to a good start if you've grown these for a few years you probably already have the rhizobia in your soil and, and it's not that important to do but that's the only example of when i would inoculate a seed that i can think of okay perfect if you can give them a trellis in your garden. Think about this. 
when you make a garden, every square foot of garden you make is a square foot that you're going to have to pull weeds on and, and take care of and maintain and manage. So when you take a vining crop that would spread far and wide and make it go vertical, you've just taken this giant footprint of the crop and turned it into about a one foot wide strip that you're managing and it makes it a lot easier. Plus when you get things vertical, the wind moves through and you have reduced amounts of some of the fruit and foliage diseases. Small crops like a cucumber, for example, or a pole bean don't need any support. When you start getting the size of a muskmelon, a cantaloupe, and certainly a watermelon, you need some sort of a sling. And I've used over the years everything from pantyhose to t-shirts to the, the netting bags you buy onions in at the grocery store to tie those fruit to the trellis. And that avoids the painful thing of coming out in the morning and your cantaloupe that was just about ripe is laying on the ground split open because it fell from four feet high uh, down onto the, onto the ground. Okay, there was a couple of questions on trellising. I know one person asked, where'd you get those red trellises? And I'm pretty sure I've seen those at Home Depot and Lowe's. Pro probably so. Those particular ones we saw there, they're not the strongest trellises. They, they're okay and they'll work. But you can buy tomato trellises that are made of very strong material that won't bend. I would suggest you avoid those little three-prong wire trellises you see in the garden centers. A tomato will eat that alive and bend it over and take it to the ground. Uh, maybe for a, a pepper plant, but for tomatoes you need something stronger. Let me give you one thing that I do on my trellises. I use a bigger panel uh, hole than this. This is about a two by four opening. Uh, I typically will go with the livestock panel, which is a four by six opening. And I will set my trellis at about a 60 degree angle, not 45, but about 60. Plant my tomatoes and things under it, and the plants just naturally go up. And things like a cantaloupe and cucumber, they can twine and grab onto it. Uh, tomatoes, you just kind of weave them through it, and you end up with this wall of foliage, and you can put the wall toward the western sun so that during the hottest part of the day, your fruit is hanging underneath that. 45 degree, or 60 degree angle and protected from the hot western sun by the What foliage. a great idea. I also have seen where they've taken pieces of panels and use zip ties yes. to do them and that way when you store them they're flat that's, you know that's and that's true. another nice thing instead of these round. <laughs> that, that is huge. I cut my panels are typically about 16 feet. They come in different lengths. I'll cut them into you know eight foot sections so they're easy to move around but uh, I know gardeners that will take them and cut them into two foot sections that will use the zip ties like Lisa said and you can make a triangular cage or a square cage. I've even put a bunch of them together and made a zigzag going down the row that I just attach the plants to. Uh, use your imagination. There's there's a hundred ways to skin that cat uh, but trellises are wonderful. Yeah, and, and they do need to be heavy enough to support the weight, yes. you know, as it gets as it gets bigger. And the last, a long, a long time ago, I used uh, the concrete reinforcing wire, which rusts, and it's a very strong wire, uh, and it holds up pretty good. I like the galvanized materials because they essentially last forever. People were asking about one wood on the bottom of this trellis that we have here. prettier basically that that's why you would not need to encase your trellises in wood uh, you could if you wanted to I just use the panel with a t-post driven into the ground and that's that's good enough for me uh, I know gardeners that will make a trellis like this and they'll put legs on it out to the side kind of like a chalk the old chalkboards you know that you could move around the classroom uh, and they'll set those in the ground uh, to give it a little bit more support. These have posts driven into the ground, some, some iron uh, posts driven well into the ground to hold them up and give them a little bit more support. So then they could be moved elsewhere if they yeah, needed to be. they could be picked be. up and moved that way. Right. You can, livestock panels are wonderful. I mean, you can take a 16 or a 20 panel and just bend it into a big arch and have all your hanging, let's say, uh, pole beans uh, hanging underneath that arch. You just poke underneath it. And that's what I did at my, my home garden and use 4T post. It works great. Yeah. And you can use that for cucumbers and any of your vining things. And you 
you also can plant some things tender underneath it that we might harvest quicker, and I've done that before too. That is true. That is true. Any other questions, Trevor? We've been going about 40 minutes, so I, let's give it another minute or two for some final questions, and then we'll, we'll call it a wrap. While I'm thinking of it, I just want to remind here, you, we've got, we <laughs> we've got the Aggie Hort Facebook Live uh, Wednesdays and, and Fridays. Friday is typically a longer show. This is a, a long show for, for uh, a Wednesday, uh, but on Fridays, uh, and you can go online and see some of the upcoming topics there. On the Facebook page there is a little calendar that shows topics that are coming up. Every one of those you get to hear from a different agent or specialist with AgriLife and you also have agents and or specialists that are answering questions online so you kind of get a chance to ask and get a good opinion from a lot of different people on a science-based uh, approach to gardening. Um, so there was a question that came in about corn um will corn be okay with the cold that's expected tonight corn corn will be okay the regular sweet corn is, is pretty tough and hardy it comes up well if uh if you plant the super sweet there, there's a lot of types of sweet corn from regular sweet corn all the way uh, up to the super sweets the super sweets have the little shriveled kernels and they don't have a lot of uh, starchy material in the kernel they don't germinate well in cold soil, so we wait a little later to plant those than we do regular sweet corn. But as far as the plant taking it down around 40, they'll be able to they'll be able to take that. Uh, the challenge with corn, gosh, out here where I've got some corn planted uh, back back in the, in the garden there. Uh, now that I'm in this wind, I'm thinking that corn is going to be horizontal when it comes up if the wind keeps blowing like this. There, there were a couple that couldn't hear all the information on inoculation. Could you maybe touch on that? Yes. Again. The, the one time when I would use an inoculant is when I'm planting beans or peas, which are legumes. They make nitrogen in nodules on their roots, or actually bacteria make nitrogen in nodules on their roots. And uh, you can moisten the seed, roll it in the inoculant dust that you can purchase online or from some garden centers. And then when you plant them, you've introduced the right bacteria that do that. Once you're growing those in a garden, you've already got the bacteria most likely and you wouldn't have to inoculate every time you plant, just initially to get some things going. Skip, there was a question about soil testing and if they want to get their soil tested, how do they do that and how do they get started um, to be able to take, get their soil tested? Okay, if one of our Q&A people could type in to the chat soiltesting.tamu.edu. Uh, that's the website. When you get there, there's going to be the regular soil test and then there's going to be something called an urban soil test. I don't care if you live in a town of 100 people out in the boonies, if it's a garden, choose the urban test. Uh, that's not for big cities, that's for landscapes and gardens. Okay. And uh, choose the urban test. You'll get to check off on there. This is for my roses, this is for my vegetable garden or whatever and they'll get you then the results based on the kind of thing you're wanting to grow. There, there is a question on the squash. If you don't have pollinators around and you want to be the pollinator, how do you do it? How do you collect the, the blooms or the pollen off the male to pollinate the female flowers? Okay, first you need to dress in some puppy costume that has yellow and black stripes. <laughs> so you look like a bee because this is important to the squash. No, actually, you just you can do it a couple ways. You can take a, a artist paintbrush, and I showed you the difference between male and female blooms. Go to the male blooms, get the pollen, and then go to the female blooms. And in the center of the flower is the pistil that comes out. And you just dust, and you can see the bright yellow pollen grains when you've dusted a few on there. Uh, and that'll do it. Uh, when I'm kind of in a hurry, I don't tend to have artist paintbrushes laying around. So I just pick a male bloom, pull the petals off, and use the structure to just paint the pollen onto the female blooms. And you can certainly do that as well. You need to pollinate every day and you need to pollinate in the morning. I try to get mine done by about 10 o'clock. Not that that's a magic time to finish, but uh, as you get later in the day, uh, some of our crops, uh, like even okra, for example, which we don't typically have to pollinate, but uh, by the time we get to about lunch, it's a done deal. And so you need to get that kind of pollinating done in the morning. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I think so. 
uh, just a reminder that if you guys are wanting uh, vegetable varieties or cultivars and planting dates for your area, check with your county extension office. They Most of our county offices have those and that's a great resource no matter where you are in the state or, or in other states if you're listening. Well, that was kind of a wide-ranging vegetable thing. Hopefully you, you've picked up a few tips that can help you out in your gardening. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again on future uh, Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live events. And in the meantime, we'll see you at, the, at your county extension office where you live. Thank you all for joining us.